Hello everyone. What is Kavya Swarupa or the ontology of Kavya according to Sanskrit literary theoreticians? This is a concept that we have briefly discussed before. But I think it is important to elaborate on this concept since it forms the core of the inquiry initiated by Sanskrit literary theory. Sanskrit Kavya Shastra always held an ontological view about literature. That is to say, it believed that it is the presence of certain special linguistic features such as poetic suggestion, figures of speech, figurative deviation, etc. that attribute literariness to a work of art. Therefore, throughout its history of almost a millennium and a half, Sanskrit Kavya Shastra was exclusively preoccupied with the task of identifying and analyzing the formal devices generating literariness in a work of art. Considering Kavya as a specialized mode of language marked by the ingenious use of certain distinctive or special linguistic devices, Kavya Shastra always made it a point to delimit Kavya from other uses of language such as Shastra, the Vedas and Varte language. We have a host of literary theoreticians in Sanskrit poetics who typify this exclusionist view of literature. Abhinava Gupta in his commentary on Anandavarthana's Dhvanyaloka distinguishes the remit of Kavya from that of the Veda and uh, Vartde language. He says both everyday sentences and Vedic sentences have meaning without being poems. Hemachandra in Kavya Anushasana says that it is the presence of four components such as Shabda or signifier, Artha or signification, Guna or poetic qualities and Alankara or figures of speech that constitutes a Kavya. Vakphada delimits the ambit of Kavya by defining it as a composition of Shabda and Artha marked by the absence of Doshas and the presence of Gunas and Alankaras. Mamada observes that uh, it is Kavya, the Kavya consists of word and sense without faults and with merits and excellences of style which may at times be without figures of speech. In Chandra Loka, Jayadeva sets the limit of poetic expression by defining Kavya as a verbal icon characterized by the absence of doshas and the presence of lakshana or deviant utterance, riti, diction or style, guna, alankara, rasa and vritti. Vidyanatha in Prataparudriya sees Kavya as a special composition of both Gadya or prose and Padya or poetry bereft of doshas and adorned by Guna, Alankara, Shabda and Artha. Bhattanayaga talks about three crucial components that are conspicuously absent in other uses of language and present only in Kavya. According to him, these three elements include Abhidayagatva or denotative function, Bhavagatva or ability to realize aesthetic experience and Bhogakritva or the experience of aesthetic emotion. In his commentary on Dhvanyaloka, Abhinava Gupta reproduces the view of Bhattanayaka. He says, rather poetic words are often an altogether different nature from ordinary words thanks to their threefold operation. Their denotative power or Abhidayagatva operates within the limits of the literal meaning. Their aesthetic efficacy or Bhavagatva operates in the area of Rasas etc. That is it transforms the Vibhavas etc. into Rasa. And their efficacy of aesthetic enjoyment Bhogakritva operates within the sensitive audience. The working of a poem consists of these three operations. So, Bhattanayaka uh, further distinguishes Kavya from Shastra and uh, historical narratives. He says, one may distinguish the Shastras by the prominence they give to the word. One knows that stories are wedded to meaning. One forms a just notion of a poem by subordinating these two, that is word and meaning and making the operation or Vyapara paramount. Kundaga opines that it is figurative deviation of speech or vakrokti 
that makes a kavya different from the ordinary expression and shastras. According to Bhoja, although poetry is generally called the combination of word and meaning, not all combinations of word and meaning uh, can claim the status of a kavya. In Shringara Pragasa, Bhoja very clearly distinguishes between kavya and other linguistic genres on the basis of the nature of language uh, employed in them. According to Bhoja, while Varte language is the explicit language of science and daily life, Kavya is the deviant language found in the text teeming with aesthetic pleasure. In Saraswati Kanthabharana, Bhoja in fact illustrates the process in which a nondescript expression is made poetic and laden with rasa through the figurative deviation of speech. Bhoja says in the expression, Hey maiden, why don't you love me who loves you a lot? We have an ordinary expression that produces only boredom because it lacks rasa or aesthetic emotion. In the god of love, that cruel person is pitiless to me, but he holds no grudge to you, my pretty eyed lass. The sense is sophisticated and generates rasa. The factors that are instrumental for the creation of rasa or the most important distinguishing mark of kavya are these. A novel idea, non-ordinary mellifluous expression, beautiful composition, clarity in articulation and meaning that conforms to propriety. Uh, in Shringara Prakasa, Bhoja lists 12 rules governing the combination of signifier or shabda and signification or artha in the production of poetic language. Of these 12 principles, while the first eight ones are common to many other forms of language, the last four ones are unique to the linguistic body of Kavya alone. And these four characteristics that Bhoja exclusively reserves for Kavya include the presence of poetic qualities, figures of speech, aesthetic emotion and the absence of poetic faults. We can see this exclusionist view of Kavya as a special linguistic category with complex literary conventions and elaborate uh, metrical schemes unchangingly uh, going down the line till the end of the active phase of Sanskrit literary culture with Jagannatha uh, in the 17th century uh, observing that Kavya is signifiers generating noble significations. According to Giro, the problem of Kavi Shastra was then seen in differentiating that particular expression we call poetic from other verbal means, Shastra and uh, narrative. And throughout its history of almost a millennium uh, and a half, Kavi Shastra never ever strayed away from this central problem. In other words, Kavi Shastra was incessantly preoccupied with the crucial task of pinpointing factors that were responsible for the specificity of poetic language. Pollock observes what substantively constitutes Kavya and how literariness comes into being were naturally matters of ongoing debate and various elements were proposed as the essence of Kavya. But the fact that Kavya has an essence uh, a self or soul as it was phrased, something marking it as different from every other language use was never doubted by anyone. So, this identification and scrutiny of formal factors that made Kavya a special use of language was primarily motivated by the hope that an inquiry into the textual elements responsible for the unique nature of Kavya will contribute greatly to the creation of good art. In their endeavor to identify the soul or the most important constituent of Kavya, different literary theoreticians or Alankarikas privileged different formal elements as the inalienable mark of literature. Samudrabantha, a 10th century commentator on Ruyaga's Alankara Sarvaswa, gives us a glimpse into this. In his commentary on Alankara Sarvaswa, Samudrabantha observes, 
literature is marked by certain special words and meaning. The speciality of these two that is Shabda and Artha can be analyzed in three ways through some language, feature or dharma or through some function vyapara or through aesthetic suggestion or dhwani. The first group contains two sects, the one that gives importance to figures of speech and the one that lays emphasis on poetic qualities. In the second sect, some pay attention to beautiful expression and the others to the capacity to produce or generate aesthetic pleasure in readers especially. Of these five groups, the last one is accepted by Uthpada and others. The second one is accepted by Vamana. The third one by the author of Vakrokti Jivida. The fourth by Nayaga, and the fifth by Anandavarthana. Although uh, there were differences of opinion among literary theoreticians as to which of these elements has to be treated as the most important or the vital element of Kavya, they all had a consensus of opinion on the notion that Kavya is definitely a unique use of language. Therefore, their efforts were unidirectionally oriented towards unraveling the various formal factors that attribute an aura of uniqueness to literature. The term Alamkara Shastra, uh, which was often used synonymously with Sanskrit poetics, readily functioned as a pointer to the teleology of Sanskrit Kavi Shastra. Uh, because of Kavi Shastra's unwavering interest in the ornaments or alankara of Kavya that made literature a higher order linguistic entity or composition, the term alankara Shastra uh, was often used synonymously with Kavi Shastra. A survey of the major theoretical positions in Sanskrit literary theories such as alankara, Riti, Guna, Vakrokti, Thwani and Aujitya will further corroborate this observation. For Bhamaha, the earliest known exponent of Kavi Shastra, it is primarily Alankaras or figures of speech that transform a piece of writing into Kavya. Therefore, in his Kavya Alankara, Bhamaha is primarily or chiefly concerned with the identification and analysis of Alankaras that beautify a work of literature. Bhamaha lists and analyzes around 38 alankaras in his attempt to identify the unique nature of Kavya Sharira or the body of Kavya. According to Bhamaha, what makes an alankara different from other uses of language is its figurative deviation of speech or vakrata uh, from ordinary language. Therefore, he employs the term alankara to refer to all the deviant linguistic expressions. Bhamaha opines that a poet should always be diligent in developing this art of figurative deviation which functions as the vital force of all alankaras. He notes, this peculiar method of statement or vakrokti is found everywhere that is in other alankaras. By this meanings are uh, rendered beautiful, poets should be assiduous in cultivating it. Where is an alankara without this? In the fifth chapter of Kavya Langara, Pamaha points out that a composition devoid of figurative deviation of sense, such as the sun has set, the moon shines, or the birds fly back to their nest, is a mere report or varta, not Kavya. But Pamaha's theory of Alankara shows is that Kavya is distinct from other uses of language by the presence of Alankaras. So, his analysis of Kavya Sharira is mainly oriented towards the identification and scrutiny of Alankaras which present everything in a defamiliarized form. Dandin in his Kavya Darsha declares that the aim of his work is to identify the elements that make up the body of Kavya. Here that is in Kavya Darsha, I state the characteristic marks of Kavya or Kavya Lakshana after my careful study and scrutiny of the previous treatises. In Kavya Darsha, Dandin broadens the scope of his scrutiny of Kavya Sharira by increasing the number of figures of speech to around 35 
and that of poetic merits to 10. Considering the amount of attention that he pays to the analysis of Alankara and Guna, we can safely assume that Dandin's conception, in Dandin's conception, Kavi Sharira is primarily constituted by Gunas and uh, Alankaras or figures of speech. Vamana's Kavya Alankara Sutra Vritti opens with a chapter titled Kavya Sharira Nirnaya or the understanding of the anatomy of Kavya. Such a self-explanatory title immediately informs us that the purpose of his work is to identify and analyze the formal factors that go into the making of the body of Kavya. Vamana sees a guna or poetic merit as the vital force of literature. According to him, a verbal expression without guna cannot become a Kavya, just as a group of words without syntax cannot make a coherent meaning. He is of the view that a literary style or riti where all the gunas are properly knit together serves as the soul of Kavya. Though Vamana opines that the body of Kavya is characterized by sound and sense uh, decorated by gunas and alankaras, he privileges gunas over alankaras. According to him, it is gunas such as sojas and prasada that are responsible for the unique nature of Kavya. The function of Alankara, on the other hand, is only to enhance the beauty of Kavya, which is already decorated or beautified uh, by the presence of Gunas. Though there is a shift of focus in Vamana's theory from Alankara to Guna, the idea that Kavya is a supranormal entity remains unchanged. Ananda Vartana, the successor of Vamana, criticizes Vamana's view that Triti is the soul of Kavya. According to Ananda, it was persons unable to analyze the true nature of poetry who propounded the doctrine of styles. For Ananda, Thwani or poetic suggestion is the soul of Kavya. Therefore, in his Thwanyaloga, Ananda Vartana examines the nature of Thwani in a detail. He states that the purpose of his critical enquiry in the following manner. He says, here some might contend that poetry is nothing more than what is embodied in word and meaning. The means of beautifying this pair that lies in sound such as alliteration and those that lie in meaning such as simile are well known. Also well known are those qualities such as sweetness which possess certain uh, properties of phoneme and arrangement. The vritti which have been described by some writers under such names as uh, Upanagarika and which are not different in function from these figures of uh, these figures and qualities also have reached our ears. So also the styles or readies such as Vaidarpi, what is this thing called Thwani that it should differ from these? According to uh, Ananda Vartana, Thwani is the linguistic device by which a sign or a set of signs uh, expresses something other than what it apparently signifies. Ananda says, the type of poetry which the wise called Dhvani is that in which sense or word subordinating their own meaning suggests that suggested meaning. According to this theory, what primarily distinguishes Kavya from other uses of language is absolutely the presence of Thwani. Uh, this does not mean that uh, Ananda Vartana turns a blind eye to the linguistic devices such as Alankara and Guna that his predecessors had previously identified as the distinguishing mark of Kavya. According to Ananda Vartana, Alankaras function like ornaments on a person's body, while Gunas are like qualities like courage. However, the soul of Kavya for him is undoubtedly Thwani or poetic suggestion. Kundaka, 10th century Sanskrit literary critic, considers Vakrokti or the figurative deviation of speech as the chief source of literariness. According to Kundaka, Kavya is that combination of Shabda or signifier and Artha or signified which shines forth with uh, Vakrata or figurative deviation of speech to impart pleasure to the readers. According to him, 
Vakrakti signifies that kind of beautiful signification or abhitha which is different from common usage. Kundaka says that these two that is Shabda and Artha are the things to be ornamented. The only ornament that beautifies them is Vakrakti. And Vakrakti issues from a poet's expertise in using language beautifully. He divides uh, Vakrada into five important categories such as Varna Vinyasa Vakrada or figurative deviation of phonemes, consonants and syllables, Pada Purvartha Vakrada or figurative deviation of uh, speech to transcend the literal meaning of a word, Pada Parartha Vakrada or figurative deviation of the terminal part of a word, Kavya Vakya Vakrada or the figurative deviation of sentence, Prakarana Vakrada or figurative deviation of episodes and finally Prabantha Vakrada or figurative deviation of plot. Considering Vakrakti as the supreme governing principle of Kavya, Kundaga makes a very thorough analysis of the various forms of Vakrakti in uh, the four chapters of his Vakrakti Jivida. So, Kshemendra, an 11th century literary critic from Kashmir holds that Aujitya or propriety is the hallmark of Kavya Sharida. Unlike the literary theoreticians we have seen before, uh, Kshemendra does not introduce any new formal features as the source of literalness. On the other hand, he lays emphasis on the proper organization of the linguistic devices which are already considered the hallmark of literature or Kavya. He is of the view that in Kavya, the proper organization of these distinct linguistic devices is as important as their presence. According to Kshemendra, neither figures of speech nor poetic merits will look charming without propriety. Kshemendra's idea or concept of Aujitya is an all-encompassing precept that is applied to all aspects of Kavya. So, emphasizing the uh, importance of propriety in Kavya, Kshemendra says, figures of speech are but ornaments, while merits of speech are mere excellences. But propriety is the abiding life of poetry, full of flavor. Kshemendra compares a poem that does not conform to the rules of propriety to a totally unruly person wearing his girdle uh, string around his neck, necklace around his waist, anklets on the hands and bracelets on the feet. By prescribing rules regarding the ontology of Kavya such as how figures of speech should be organized, how characters should be represented on stage or in literature or how different sentiments should be expressed or portrayed, Aujitya delimits the ambit of Kavya from the non-descript use of language. In short, by laying out rules regarding the composition of literature, Kshemendra adhered to the view that literature is a special way of using language and literariness is clearly a textual entity emanating from the writer's sense of decorum or propriety or aujitya concerning the organization of various formal elements. So, from this analysis, we can arrive at two major points that are central to this uh, study of Kavi Shastra. First of all, the entire epistemology of Kavi Shastra had a consensus of opinion on the idea that Kavya is a special way of using language. And secondly, the chief concern of Kavi Shastra was the identification and scrutiny of different linguistic elements responsible for the unique nature of Kavya. It is significant to note that Sanskrit Kavi Shastra in its canonical form is very much similar to Russian formalism in the uh, Western critical praxis. Formalism like Sanskrit literary science sees literature as a special mode of language which is distinctly different from ordinary language. Uh, according to Terry Eagleton, the formalist saw literary language as a special kind of language in contrast to the ordinary language we are familiar with or we commonly use. For formalists, uh, uh, the central function of ordinary language is to communicate 
to auditors a message or information by reference to the world existing outside of language. The linguistics of literature differs from the linguistics of uh, practical discourse or common language because its laws are oriented towards the production or, or oriented towards producing the distinctive features that formally is called literariness. Mukarovsky in his standard language and uh, poetic language says that poetic language unlike the ordinary language of everyday life foregrounds its unique nature by pushing communication into the background and inviting the readers or the spectators attention to its own unique form. This conception of literature as a special mode of language endorsed by Mukharovsky typifies the view of all formalist critics about literature. So, the primary uh, function of these special formal devices uh, according to Viktor Shklovsky is to defamiliarize or estrange literary language from ordinary use of language. Uh, assuming that a literary work has a non-ordinary uh, ontology characterized by the presence of literariness, the formalist critics were preoccupied with the task of identifying and analyzing the special formal devices generating or creating literariness in a work of art or literature. In the lines uh, cited by Eichenburn, uh, Roman Jacobson observes, the object of study in literature is not literature but literariness that is what makes a given work a literary work. Uh, what we should specifically note here is that both the formalist theoretical position in the West and Sanskrit Kavi Shastra or literary tradition in the East hold an exclusionist view of literature which proposes that only certain uses of language characterized by a special treatment can qualify to become uh, literature. So, these are the major points that we have discussed. I will just quickly uh, review all the major points that we have discussed so far. The first point was that Kavya is distinctly different from the ordinary form of speech. The second point was that considering Kavya as a special mode of language, this literary theoretician started understanding Kavya Sharira. They started identifying the special formal features making a piece of writing Kavya. And finally, we have seen that uh, uh, there is a lot of similarity between formalism and Sanskrit Kavya Shastra. So, depending upon the question of what makes a piece of writing Kavya, uh, Sanskrit literary theoreticians in fact came up with various formal features such as Dhvani, Alankara, Guna, Vakrokti, uh, poetic suggestion etc. So, the point we need to necessarily uh, remember here is that despite all these differences of opinion as to what formal element they should consider as the soul of literature, all these theoretical, uh, all these literary theoreticians firmly believed that Kavya is a distinct entity. I hope you have understood these lessons. Thank you.